Hello, everyone, and hello, our panelists. I would like to welcome everyone to this panel discussion about the upcoming German elections. Okay. The language of the panel is going to be English. However, willkommen bei uns in Metropolia und Ost Helsinki. Heute besprechen wir die bevorstehenden Bundestagswahlen. Ich möchte Ihnen danken, dass Sie heute mit uns hierher gekommen sind. That, thank you. Danke schön. That was unfortunately as much German as I'm able to produce. First, to start off with, I would like to ask the ambassador, uh, could, you, could you please briefly describe the German election system to all of us? Thank you. Well, I'd love to do that. And thank you very much for having us here. I've been very impressed by the short tour we had in the premises. And I'm very much aware that you're working both in still in a hybrid model. So we have an audience who is with us via camera, I presume. And that's what you were telling us also about your approach. And the element I took on from all these different stations I was visiting today was that you have this bridging into the real life. Now, real life back in Germany now presently is dominated by election campaigning and by a quite new feeling about this kind of election. It's the 20th general election we're having, but what are we talking about? We're talking about um, 60.4 million Germans eligible to vote. We're talking about 54 parties in the run-up in that election campaign, which some I couldn't even mention by heart and by name, but who are on the list. And the voter, he will have two votes to cast in that system. Now, 54, two votes sounds very complicated. In the end, it narrows down to, let's say, six parties who are in the closest realm of getting actual chances to be either in the uh, government or in order of any kind of meaningful role, politically speaking. Why is that so? We'll come back to it later, because not every party of those is then practically even having chances to move into parliament. But they're on the list. Now, the voter has to vote in like um, 299 constituencies. And what do they do? They actually vote candidates from that constituency. So it's regional candidates. Now, you have, of course, perhaps seen a few pictures here and there. What is it about? Uh, the main candidates. The main candidates we call in German the Spitzenkandidaten. So those, to be very simple, where the party expects, oh, they could be chancellor after the election, Spitzenkandidaten. That's not the head of parties automatically, and that's not what people will find actually in the list. There is no space to cross Mr. Laschet or Mr. Scholz or Mrs. Baerbock, because that's only the case when you are by accident, so to speak, in the constituency of these personalities. So you vote for a regional representative of the party for the first vote, and secondly, for the list, the so-called list of the party, second vote, and that's giving the weight to the party according to these second votes to be represented in parliament. The first, we call it a direct mandate. It's the person you vote directly. In best of cases, you actually know the person and know what you choose. And the second is a list. The list is then filled, of course, with names as well by party chose. So the party gives you information on the election sheet. These and these personalities will be in our list. And then it depends very much how many votes they get and how many people from that list actually will have chances to move into the parliament. Bottom ranks, of course, have lesser chances. Top ranks, they're being fought for in the internal party setup, have greater chance to be actually elected. Now, what do they vote? They vote for the chancellor. They don't vote for uh, president or others. This is a different system with us. Uh, head of state is the federal president, Mr. Steinmeier. He has his own election coming up later on after that one. This is general elections for parliament. And then the parties will, according to the majorities in parliament, vote for chancellor. There is no guarantee that the party who has the greatest number of votes actually would also present the chancellor. There have been cases in Germany where 
Mr. Kohl, in that case for CDU, had the mo most votes, but in the end it turned out to be another coalition government because one of the coalition partners would not really want to go along with him. So this is a little bit the setting we're looking at. And um, why is it special? Because for 16 years we have seen the same chancellor. And we will go into that later on, I believe, to get the specifics. But for four million people who are the first time voters, this is quite a challenge. They're 18 years old if they're eligible to vote. And for 16 years, they have been one chancellor, so they haven't known much else, at least as newcomers. And um, now we have polls, of course, indicating what will happen on the 26th of September, which is the election day. Um, we have a saying in German politics, man muss nicht die Umfragen gewinnen, sondern die Wahl. You don't have to gain the polls, you actually have to gain in the elections. So the polls now are interesting enough and it gives, provides for a new atmosphere, but it's not very indicative for the actual results of the election. Although we also have the possibility to vote by correspondence, by letter, which many Germans actually use, and if they do so, they actually close the envelopes right now to send them off in time, because they have to be well ahead of the actual physical election date. Some people discuss that this may be an influencing thing because the last couple of meters in the election campaign where it really heats up are not covered by these votes in the envelope you send up earlier on. So this is an issue to be discussed. Plus you have, of course, from the eligible voters also a large portion which is abroad. We estimate that we have three million Germans being spread all around the world who may be eligible to vote. And we do have a physical challenge to get them integrated into the system because it's all done in paper. We're not very IT prone. And you have to wait for the offices to send you the documents and they have to be sent back. Now, if you sit in Australia and you have um, pandemic uh, postal services, this is quite a challenge. So what we can say now is that we expect to have a coalition government. So with all these parties, Times are over of the large parties who can choose one partner and then rule. We very much expect this to be a three-party coalition of whatever composition. That's the setting. 60 million voters, 4 million new voters, two votes, direct, indirect, and a parliament which in the end of the day may have anything between 600 and 700 members of parliament. Again, a very nice topic to, to debate on. But this is one of the biggest worldwide for whatever reason. I mean, we think we are third or fourth by size, so closely after China and North Korea for that matter. But um, that's the prospects. Thank you. Interesting. I would like to hear some reactions to the... Um, to the... Um, we heard now this election system. Should I maybe... Is it okay now, the voice, sound? Okay. So how would you react to any distinctive features that you now heard about the German election system? Is there something you would like to brought up that you see as distinctive features? If you, let's say, we compare with the Finnish system. Yes, please. Well, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this event. Um, it's the first time that I talk to a live audience and uh, actually see the people I'm, I'm talking uh, <laughs> with and to. And uh, I have to say that's both exciting and also very strange. Uh, um, but this, um, as we have already heard, is going to be a very uh, crucial election. Uh, as Mr. Ambassador already explained, uh, the person now uh, uh, acting as chancellor uh, is stepping down after 16 years in office. And that is already the first big, uh, and perhaps the biggest thing about this election. It's also the first time in post-war uh, German history uh, that the chancellor does not seek re-election, but withdraws uh, uh, voluntarily from, from office. And the fact that Angela Merkel is not uh, in the race already would have made this election very unpredictable. But the second thing is that uh, adding to this uncertainty caused by Merkel's withdrawal uh, comes that the German political system has actually uh, been undergoing similar changes that we have seen 
uh, in other European countries. Uh, the bonds between German uh, voters and the German parties have clearly loosened over the last one or two decades. Until the early 2000s, uh, actually Germans big political blocs, the center-right CDU, CSU, and the center-left SPD. They, they had very big and loyal uh, voter bases, and together they could collect, uh, collect uh, around 75% of all votes cast. I mean, three-fourths of all the votes uh, cast. Uh, but over the last decades, what we, ha what we have seen is that uh, the voters are much more prone to switch parties. Uh, we have seen increased political volatility, so uh, elections are increasingly unpredictable. Uh, and we have seen increased political fragmentation, so the big parties are no longer able to hold on to, to all of their supporters. Uh, we have also seen uh, the emergence of, of the Greens as, uh, as a big political force. Uh, they, they yet have to prove that in a, in a federal election but they are already doing very well in the polls. And we have seen uh, the consolidation of the uh, populist right-wing uh, Alternative für Deutschland as one of Germany's uh, parties. The third thing I would like to mention uh, is that uh, this election has been very much centered on, on the candidates, not so much on issues, not so much on, on parties even, very much on the candidates. And you can perhaps understand that because uh, this is the election where uh, Germans are going to choose uh, the successor of Angela Merkel. So of course there's going to be a uh, strong focus on the personality of the next uh, chancellor. And of the three principal candidates we have in the running, Armin Laschet of the CDU, CSU, Annalena Baerbock of the Greens, and Olaf Scholz of the SPD, uh, two of them had had, have had a very, very difficult campaign. They have uh, made mistakes, small mistakes maybe, but mistakes that the voters think uh, are important enough uh, for them uh, not to be considered as very trustworthy can candidates. And this has played to the advantage of, of the third candidate, Olaf Scholz. Uh, Scholz has also been very uh, skillful in presenting him himself as, as, as the natural heir the natural successor uh, to Merkel. Fourthly, as was already men mentioned by Mr. Ambassador, the COVID situation still marks this election. So he was very right in pointing out that uh, some voters are already casting their votes. That means that uh, these voters no longer follow, or maybe they follow, the two last TV debates uh, among the principal candidates, but uh, those debates are no longer going to uh, influence their voting. And the fifth thing uh, I would also like to mention uh, concerns uh, the, f the forming of the next government. So it's very likely that we will see a coalition government, and it's also very likely that we will see uh, a coalition between parties that have never governed together at the federal level, maybe at the regional level, but not at the federal level. Uh, all this makes this election very interesting, at least for someone who is very passionate about <laughs> German politics. Uh, I hope it's interesting uh, in your view as well. Thank you. Then I think Annalena would like to continue. Please. Uh, I would like to underline why we are witnessing very historic elections in Europe. The German elections, they absolutely are the most important election this year. And uh, for Finland, we are a quite small country next to Russia and our foreign and security politics is uh, we have shared pretty much the same values than Germany. So for Finland it's very crucial what's the future of the German foreign and security politics. And uh, that's one way to frame the elections and look at those three main candidates. They all, Armin Laschet, Annalena Baerbock and Olaf Scholz, they share pretty much the same vision when thinking about the European Uni Union and uh, the, the role of Europe. But they do have quite big differences when thinking more detailed uh, their politics. And that's why it, it 
place a, there's a there's a it, it does matter who's the next chancellor when thinking for instance uh, Germany's uh, relation to Russia and to China. And yes, we can talk more detailed if we, if, if we are interested, what are the differences uh, between those three candidates. But uh, to really simplify, they are all quite good European candidates. Uh, they, in, in the Finnish debate and also in Germany, they are framed so that, uh, that Armin Laschet uh, he comes from the Merkel's Christian Democratic Party. So he is pretty much the same what Merkel has done. And, uh, and uh, Annalena Baerbock from the Green candidate, she's, she has most, to, to most new ideas. She's the one who really could change the status quo in, um, in European politics. And now, uh, in polls, the best position is a little bit surprising having a social democratic candidate, Olaf Scholz. He plays now quite clever in his campaign that he is, he is uh, Merkel in a suit, one can say. Uh, he's very st stable and uh, people, German voters do know him quite well. But what they don't know is how because SPD has been uh, in the second party, the, the second party in the Merkel's coalition for ages, but we don't know yet how would SPD actually lead the country. But I can't say who's going to win. But now there's a historic change in the polls. Um, Merkel's party, Christian Democrats, they are they are under the 20% right now in the polls, and that's, that's historic low. And what's surprising also is how well the Social Democrats are doing, because it's only a couple of years ago we really thought that that's the end of that party. And in Green, Green Party, we have seen very um, quick uh, changes. Annalena Baerbock was um, only half, an, half a year ago uh, the big favor in the election, but now she really needs to fight to to be the next chancellor. Very exciting elections coming, and very important for all 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 Europeans. Thank you, thank you, Annalena. Now I think Kaya, would yeah. you like to comment yes, thank also? Thank you, and thank you for the possibility to be here. I'm no expert in politics <laughs> and have to be honest that I've spent my weekend trying to catch up what's actually happening in Germany at the moment. <coughs> have uh, a long time ago had a possibility to enjoy the cooperation in what we have established between the countries in higher education. I've been an exchange student myself a very long time ago. But um, now when I'm hearing the experts and, uh, and uh, ambassador, I read uh, also very interesting sounds that anything can happen now, but that the, uh, was it even close to 60% of the population are over 50 years old in Germany? And now you are telling that there is about 4 million new voters. Uh, and, and I just, that was something I didn't know that this um, SPD as a party was always vanishing and now is like number one in the polls. So sounds to me very interesting. So also one more detail that I learned it was that uh, Germans don't necessarily like to vote for a person. So how loyal are they for the parties? Because now sounds that is there is something very un unexpected going to happen in Germany, which we <laughs> normally here in Finland rely on being very stable and structured. Well, Please. I could at least underline this impression that it is a new feeling. So the atmospheric about it. It's all about content as well, but it's also about atmospheric. It's the first time since 1960 that we have the clear expectation will be a three-party coalition. It's 16 years change because it's also about a generational change within the parties. Some did that earlier on. We have the uh, liberals, the FDP, with Mr. Lindner, who actually got kicked out of parliament not too long ago and had to come back the whole stretch and be back in the 
polls at around 10 percentage points, whatever. We had the SPD phenomenon, which uh, 18 months ago was almost in the doldrums and did not look like coming out of that for different reasons about generational change, of a continuous change of leadership within the party, and of huge debate within the party. Very heterogeneous different streams and newcomers and old functionaries being present there. So that's one aspect which was new. And a similar phenomenon now somehow with the CDU, CDU, the party of Mrs. Merkel, because you could say it was not very clear who would be the inner party circle successor, crown princess or crown prince. There was an attempt, 2018, to regulate this and to make a transition. But um, to put in a very neutral point, it did not convince very much within the party and without the party. Plus, you have a specific element in this particular campaign with the CDU, which is a union of CDU and CSU. And the CSU being in the regional branch, Christian Democratic Social Unit in Bavaria. And um, sometimes it happened with the SPD before, but presently with the CDU, the largest contenders and competitors are within the parties and not other parties, <laughs> opposing parties. So Mr. Laschet, the main candidate of CDU, somehow it has to find a position with Mr. Söder, who is from the CSU, and who had also at one point put forward his candidacy to become the main contender, the Spitzenkandidat for that party. So there's inner party uh, issues there. The Greens fared better with a generational changeover with a double team Baerbock and Habeck, and then peacefully they agreed on having Mrs. Baerbock as the main candidate. So you see, it's not only about what's going to happen, but it feels like a shift, a shift to a new generation, to new politicians. And it is true that German electorate was rather complacent in the sense that the biggest slogan of Mrs. Merkel four years back was, you know me. That was the campaign, basically. So there was not much of a debate. And that led a little bit to the expectation now that with the present candidates being rather fresh in that perspective and with the new outlook on coalition settlements, it becomes more of an equal field. Now, everybody is hovering above these 20 percentage points, and then you have FDP liberals 10 and the right wing perhaps also in that range. So that's an interesting new constellation with this element of surprise, as you were saying, but also from transition. It is a transitional vote. Yeah. What that would translate into subject matter and policy lines, we can speculate, we can read the party programs, all the party programs together, it's 1,000 pages, so feel free. <laughs> um, looking at foreign policy issues you were mentioning, it's about 90 pages altogether, it's a little bit more focused. But nevertheless, it's, um, this, for the electorate, it's the feeling about transition. And I presume they would not so much look into this or that item on the agenda of the parties. It plays a role then in the coalition making, very much. But for the electorate in the first place, yes, it has been a very personalized, to the personal profiles of the candidates' campaign so far. Yeah. Very good. Could I just... You can comment on, on, on what we've been discussing, but I would like to move on a little bit to thinking about now that Merkel is stepping down and Germany has traditionally had a has been a major player in, in the European Union. Do you think, do you see that this change will also lead to uh, some change in the European, on the European level? Um, let's say, do we see a rise of other European countries, for instance, within EU, or what happens to the economic discipline that Germany and perhaps uh, Mrs. Merkel herself has been uh, uh, identified with. So you could, perhaps I would also like to ask you to, to think about these questions. I think uh, Annalena had first her hand up and then, would you like to comment, start? Yeah. One comment to Baya. Uh, she just said something very important, uh, because the Germans uh, we see the phenomenon that the young generation and the older, they are really voting differently. And uh, Germany traditionally, we see that the East and the West mm. vote, vote differently. But now we, now we also see that the young and the elder and their, their elders Elderly people. But it's, it's very important to understand that the young, young, young youngsters and the elderly people are voting differently. And the it's East and West are voting differently. Almost 60% over 50, that's true. 
Yes. And that's why, that's very uh, interesting is also uh, the Greens right now. They are really now one of the main mainstream mainstream parties in Germany, and that's, uh, they are resonating to the young, youngsters and uh, to the people living in the city, big cities. So there are fragmentation and new phenomenals, and that makes also it's more difficult to really like say who's gonna win. But generally speaking, why Olaf Scholz is now so popular um, just underlines that Germans, they really, are stability freaks. They, they want the same. And that's why they voted Angela Merkel so many times. So anyway, that we are not having Merkel this time, German chancellor, is a huge, huge change. Okay, Thomas, I think maybe you wanted to comment on the role of Germany after the Merkel steps down? Yes, yes. Um, first of all, I mean, <clears throat> I would say that Merkel has, of course, been one important component when it comes to Germany's role in the EU. Uh, her long period in office has given her a unique chance to follow EU politics from, from the inside, and uh, she has certainly played a, a key role uh, in managing several EU crises. Uh, and, of course, that experience, uh, that authority that she commands, the skills that she has, uh, the, the, the memory of previous meetings that she has, that will be a way. Um, but that said, um, I would still say that uh, Germany's role in the EU it is, of course, first and foremost based on its size, on its uh, size in terms of population, on its uh, size in terms of economy, and that's not uh, going to go away that soon. Um, and when, when, when it comes to um, to like the, the more specific policy line of Germany, uh, then there are of course uh, differences, uh, even rather big differences between uh, the individual parties. But what is true and what, what was already highlighted by Anna-Lina is that uh, all uh, the mainstream German parties, basically all the parties that have a chance to enter the next government, uh, perhaps excluding uh, the left party, uh, which has been speculated as a, as a potential uh, government, party, I, I, myself, I don't see that as a, as a very realistic possibility. But anyway, all the mainstream parties are very uh, committed uh, uh, Europeans, they're very uh, pro-EU. Uh, but, but of course, there are differences between them. There are differences when it comes to uh, fiscal policy, uh, Eurozone governance. There are differences when it comes to uh, climate uh, protection, there are differences when it comes to individual foreign policy issues, when it comes to individual defense policy is issues. Uh, what we cannot say uh, for sure at this point is how those differences are going to play out mm. in, the, in the next coalition negotiations, uh, because the situation at the moment is so uncertain. And uh, if we think about Germany's e economic role, um, I think there are, there are two things that we have to take in, into consideration here. First, this pandemic time has seen just a really huge shift in the economic policies of all the EU member states. And uh, we still don't know how all this will evolve, uh, how much uh, time it will take for us uh, to overcome uh, the pandemic and its economic consequences. Uh, and that, I think, uh, casts a, a very big shadow over uh, economic policy. Um, again, that said, I, I think uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, this kind of fiscal uh, policies and Eurozone issues, Scholz, for, for example, as finance minister, has been rather cautious. Uh, he agreed to the recovery fund, uh, which was very much debated here in Finland, uh, 
but, but he has been actually a uh, very, very traditional uh, German um, economic uh, policy maker, one could say. And, and some of the constraints uh, that have uh, shaped German uh, fiscal and economic policy uh, are, are perhaps not going to go away that soon. Uh, there's the so-called debt break uh, at the national level. Uh, there's the, constitution, uh, the federal constitutional court, which is a very big player when it comes to uh, treaty issues. And there's the finance minister, uh, where the, the staff uh, still thinks very much along uh, traditional German economic lines. Okay, thank you. Now I think it's time to activate also our audience. We heard some names already here mentioned several times of the candidates. See, I can make this work, yes. I would like to invite you all to participate in our poll. Who will win the Bundestag elections? You see the instructions there on the screens. You go to this Menti address and you will find there a code. So first, dot menti.com and then you need to uh, uh, put the code in and you should be able to enter the page where you can select your candidate. And maybe the next question I could ask that um, the, uh, Thomas, you very well already said about Merkel's legacy and if I understood correctly, things most likely will continue um, the same way or roughly the, what they have been. Um, I would still like to ask you to think about how do you see this? Do you see that there are things that will actually change? I think, Thomas, you were more about what that things that will perhaps remain unchanged, but do you see things that will actually change now as a result of, of Merkel stepping down? And could you bring those up, your thoughts about that? Anyone, please. Annalena, please. Well, um, Merkel is and has been a chancellor of crises. She's been the leader of the Europe, the most powerful leader of the, in Europe 16 years. And during those years, we have had the, first the finance crisis, then we euro crisis, then we saw the new aggressive Russia and annexation of Crimea. Then we, uh, then st then we saw the beginning of the Syria war and Russia bomb bombing there and causing a huge European crisis, the ref refugee crisis. Then came Brexit. And then, as a shock for Europe and transatlantic uh, cooperation, Donald Trump was elected to the President of the United States. And now we are in, in the middle of the pandemic still. So uh, Angela Merkel really has played a crucial role in solving that, uh, though all those crises. And uh, one big part of the legacy of Merkel's era is the more shared analysis that Europe must be ready to act more independently uh, and taking care of Europe's own security issues. That hasn't been historic historically easy for Germans, but, uh, but now, now there's a will at least. But at the same time, because of all those crises, Europe is more and more divided and that makes that makes it even more harder. So actually, Merkel, she is or wasn't that big a strategist, but she really believes the un unity of Europe and she managed to do that. And Brexit and Trump, they both were really big shocks for, especially personally for Angela Merkel. And we have seen her as a strong supporter of the liberal democracy. And that is, that is a big part of her legacy. And now there's much more uncertain situation polit politically in whole Europe. We don't only wait the German elections. There are next year election in France. And that's again 
we need to ask that how united is Europe and how strong is this commitment to the liberal democracy actually. And well, um, it's not only Germany that has the main role in the future of the Europe, it's all the other EU countries and also the transatlantic relationship. And now we, we are in the middle of the Afghanistan crisis. So, so, so Europe's constantly facing new crises. So we'll see that how, how strong is actually the legacy of Merkel's thinking that we are more stronger together than alone. Would you like to please? I fully subscribe to that analysis. Um, I think one is fair to point out that indeed, if you talk about legacy, the international perspective is much stronger with this Ms. Merkel than the domestic perspective. Um, because it was about, like former British Prime Minister said, events, events, events. So there was a very strong challenge for uh, Germany, but for Mrs. Merkel particularly in that situation, to bring different ends together, to find for the compromise, to use her experience and skill and trust, which was put forward, for mediating roles somehow, to mediate between different uh, crises. And there's, the list is very long. Uh, you mentioned Syria and others, but there was Libya popping up, there was Iran issues popping up. So a lot of uh, challenges there. And this, I think she really took actively this role of trying to find this middle position, be it the G7, the G20, whatever. So that's quite a large task ahead of whoever wants to fill that gap, be it a European group or be it a single nation, whatever. It somehow grew on her. It was definitely not on the agenda when she just started the first day, that's what I'm going to do. It just happened. Um, on the domestic issues, there's also a, a side to that because it may have distracted a little bit from what kind of reforms are needed within Germany. I mean, we've been talking about fiscal issues and about a certain frugal approach. Yes, true. Um, so balancing of the budget was an issue continuously followed up by different coalition governments with uh, changing Minister of Finance, and there was not much addition between Social Democratic Minister of Finance or a Conservative Minister of Finance. It was all the zero they were aiming at, and it was called the black zero, by the way, also by the Social Democratic Minister of Finance. But that led to quite other issues not being solved. So we have a huge demand for uh, modernizing infrastructure. That's why we look at Finland for IT solutions and others. We have a huge demand for physical investments, schooling, uh, railways, whatever. So there is a certain lack in that. And um, we call it the reform stau. So there was a, a backlog of reforms taking place. Um, it's not something you can pinpoint to the chancellor in person alone, but the whole situation led to that kind of new situation. And that's part of this element of change where the Greens actually can bank on to say, look, it's obvious we have to do something differently, be it energy, be it transportation, be it whatever it is. And the uh, pandemic has accentuated this. The recent floodings have accentuated this feeling, climate change is ahead, whatever. So there is this feeling in the general public saying, hmm, we have to do something, so something has to be done. It's not very clear which direction, but at least as a sentiment, atmospheric change is there. And I think um, as to continuity, perfectly right to point out that, yes, the basic framework conditions remain, plus a huge body of civil servants who are not very revolutionary minded. But <laughs> nevertheless, I mean, it is about what you look at. And if you look at neighborhood developments, the pressure is even mounting. You have discussions on rule of law within Europe, within the established club of the European Union. You have, of course, challenges in international law, like the Russian annexation of Crimea, where to go with that. And you have um, a new global competition between the United States or China coming up, and we have to position ourselves here in, in Europe what to do about that. So no easy task there. And I think the, the legacy of Ms. Merkel would be to go on in this mediating, mediating middle position thing. Uh, always with this strong pro-European sentiment that we have to do this together. Um, not by changing any little detail in European policies in Germany, we still have gained even more relative weight by the exit of the British from the Union after the Brexit. 
fair enough, we pay more for the budget, but still the relative size has even grown. So that will be also a new kind of apprehensions from other member states. How will this potential elephant in the porcelain room move in European politics? But I think the, the stress I wanted to make is all this is true for us to discuss on the international perspective, but still it's also a local sentiment. And the question is, what do the voters do? Uh, you were mentioning on demography. That's interesting because the CDU, CDU, who used to be one of the large blocks of voters, since the last couple of votes and since the first vote of Mrs. Merkel six years back, has lost almost nine million voters just by old age. Yeah. So there is a shift, a generational shift also taking place. Um, the 50s plus a few years, they're still considered to be young in German context. <laughs> so they will be very prone to, to green <laughs> party issues. I mean, they have grown with the greens. Um, they're more or less well-established bourgeois greens, but still. So you could see that we have two liberal blocs there. One is more ecological green, one is so more businesslike. is there a significant difference if you are just over 50 or if you are 70? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So both these blocks are growing. And the, the question will be also a little bit, how would they actually recognize themselves in the present campaign? Or would they just stay home and say, well, this is getting too complicated, too fragmented, I'd rather absent from my vote? I don't know how the participation level actually would develop in this context of hmm, who to choose, what, who is standing for what. It's an open race. The only thing which is true, after elections, everyone would have predicted that ex post <laughs> and said, oh, this result is logic. But it's not, at, to be very honest, it's not at the moment right now. So no. many people still feel that the options are all there, but it, that very much depends how coalitions will be formed mm. and what accent will then be given to different approaches. And on the gender lines, there are differences. Talking Russia, talking China, there are differences within the parties. You would then also see slowly, slowly uh, transported. Changes, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Could I bring us now uh, for a while? We can, we can come back to the Mecca's legacy, if that's OK. I would like to bring us now here to Metropoli, actually, and a little bit touch on what the ambassador you were saying about the ways of, of working, ways of, of living in Germany. And, and you're looking to Finland for, for learning, perhaps, in some, some aspects. I would actually like to ask Vera. Uh, from a student perspective, you have studied in Germany for, for some time, some time ago, I understood. Um, how was it actually, if you think about your daily life and in your studies, ways of, of studying, ways of working in Germany that you experienced, that if you would compare what would you bring from there here to Metropolia and also the other way around, what would you bring from Metropolia to, to the German way of, of studying and, and living? according to your own experiences? Um, yes, so I've been um, studying in Germany twice, actually. Uh, I did one, one week exchange uh, about a year ago, uh, in the beginning of 2020, in Hildesheim. And then I have now just arrived back to Finland. I spent the summer semester of 2021 in Berlin. And, um, well, it's quite uh, complicated, maybe, to make some comparison. Comparisons. Comparisons. Thank yeah. You yes. No. <laughs> Since um, I have not uh, done any distance studying in Metropolia, and then again uh, in Germany, everything was online. So that also uh, clearly brings a lot of differences. Um, but what I really enjoyed about my studies in Germany was. Uh, I feel there was much more international perspective to the studies there. Uh, I study social uh, services, by the way. <laughs> and so a lot of the courses uh, were dealing with very international um, things. <laughs> yeah, international issues, perhaps, yes, and having an international exactly. perspective. Uh, yes. And uh, that's something. Uh, I would like to see more in Metropolia. And I think in Finland in general also, talking about this uh, election and uh, how uh, EU is uh, part of our daily lives, I feel like in Germany uh, I could see much more news from uh, France or Italy or uh, I think it was much more uh, attached to Europe. 
uh, then in Finland, I don't see so much um, uh, European topics uh, in uh, in media. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Please do go on if you have something else you would like to bring up. Mm -hmm. the, and then there was. Uh, I was thinking now if if something else. This was very interesting actually. The um, the European perspective that you saw more sort of actively in, in, in where you went Germany, it just reminds, reminds me of us still perhaps here in Finland living in the northernmost corner of, of EU. I don't know if, if that has an impact. Something else perhaps that you would like to bring up from your daily life when you were in Germany, so, something you reflected on, that this is done differently uh, compared to here in Finland. Is there something that comes to your mind? Um, uh, I think like, well, well, our daily life in the studies, uh, what I noticed that was different, even though I said I haven't experienced that much online studies in Finland, but I, I must say I feel like in Metropolia we are a bit ahead uh, when it comes to technology and um, that sort of thing. So <laughs> that was also a difference between okay. Metropolia and Ali Solomon High School. Okay. Thank you, Vera. And now I would also like to have a, a teacher, lecture perspective. And Kaya, I know that uh, you've been uh, working with uh, Metropolis German Partners. And uh, how would you uh, describe uh, the collaboration that you are involved in? Um, how, has it changed? Has it developed in any way during, during the time that you've been actively involved in collaboration? And what do you see as a future perspective? for the collaboration. Okay, thank you. Quite a many questions to answer. <laughs> you can also choose to focus on one. Yes. Um, well, my history here in, in Metropolia goes back to 2008. That's when I joined the university, and uh, that's actually when it was formed. So, um, but um, looking back, all, already being myself a student, so it's been nice that we've had this exchange, student exchange and staff exchange already decades. And I think my generation that time, we were even studying in German when we went to Germany and there wasn't that much offering in English actually. So that's one thing that's definitely changed. Now the German universities are also trying to increase the offering that they have in English. Um, but then um, what has changed that when I joined, I'm representing here business school, I'm lecturing there and, and have also worked as a head of our international programs. So I have to tell uh, Nora that I'm not quite agreeing with you that Metropolia wouldn't be very international because we, <laughs> we are actually having, was it like 38 German partners only and, and uh, we have even, uh, was it eight partners with double degree programs? So I'm lecturing in programs called the International Business and Logistics and European Business Administration. So we actually, uh, that year, uh, there around 2008, when we established first so-called double degree um, contracts, also with some German partners. I think the first German partner most likely was in Berlin, so where we have two. But we have, of course, business uh, students and business studies are from nature such that they really are perhaps more eager to go abroad and learn languages. But I've learned from my colleagues, we have many of them there in the audience, that we also have um, several uh, programs um, in engineering and also in social services who do very interesting cooperation. And how the cooperation has changed from this very traditional uh, student-teacher exchanges that really now we plan curricula together. We have these double degrees where the students really get two certificates from two different universities. Um, but we also have during the years um, various type of joint courses. Online, perhaps to start with, then the students have had the chance to really spend a week or two in both countries and cooperate, having some kind of development project or research project. Personally, I've also been involved in such and um, mainly, I think, in, in bachelor's level, but also uh, cooperation in master's level. And um, then uh, what I've been enjoying the last few years that now when we are also entitled to have more research, we're looking for external funding, so we are uh, applying for, for money from different sources. And um, actually this autumn, now I'm crossing my fingers, that we would uh, get the, the funding for a joint um, uh, Erasmus 
cooperation relationship, um, how is it the right word, the call, you know, someone might need to help me, but uh, in uh, higher education, so we actually um, were planning with a partner in um, Saarbrücken and a partner in Tallinn, that we, in case we get funding, we would uh, um, have a joint course uh, and um, utilize more digitalization, have a like joint simulation uh, game there that the mixed groups would be playing together from these different universities. So Germans are really interested in this digitalization and using how to what to learn from us also in that respect. And the other topic there is the sustainability. How can we teach with help of, for example, now gaming industry, gaming simulations or more our youth for to understand the importance of sustainability. And um, Heidi, you are new in Metropolia now, um, but we are talking about um, continuous learning now all the time. So even though we of course think as our customers, our students, young people, but we have a very wide variety in our student body. So also people of my age even want to update their knowledge, <laughs> and especially now when we're talking about digitalization. So there might be an opportunity to develop new curricula, new offering, and I know also the entrepreneurship is something that's interesting. Germans tend to be very interested now to cooperate, as at least um, we would have even more partners who would be willing to have agreements with us, uh, and sometimes we just have to say no, we, we have to put on hold because we just don't have enough uh, resources for that. Um, I think I learned from my colleagues that at the moment we are having just from Germany over 70 incoming exchange students and we are sending around 50. That's like been the last few years. And um, I think personally I've now had two weeks uh, teaching on campus in Muramaki and uh, German students are always very excellent students, my, my personal experience. And, but they, as, as you said, they are giving us also um, um, thanks that we have more perhaps learning by doing type of approach what comes to pedagogics, that we, we try to involve companies and, and projects and, and a little bit different type of pedagogy than the lecturing, what, perhaps still are in many universities in, in Germany. Now I had a very long speech. Thank you, thank you. So it's nice to know about the, uh, that what is happening now in, 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 in here in Metropolia. I would like to now come back as a final theme for our panel, back to the America's legacy, but link that to the collaboration between Finland and, and Germany. Do you see uh, there is going to be any changes in this collaboration? Is the, is the impact of the, of the elections going to be seen also in the collaboration between Finland and Germany, where we heard some excellent uh, concrete examples, both from Vera and Kaja? Any comments on that? Linking it now to the uh, Merkel's legacy. Anyone? Vera, would you like to start? Uh, I must say, first of all, about Merkel's legacy is, um, well, I don't know Europe without Merkel. She has been <laughs> the councillor for as long as I can remember. And um, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I really hope that there are good relation between Germany and Finland and also um, that whoever follows Merkel is going to also appreciate a unified uh, EU. <laughs> Thank you. A very good point. Mr. Ambassador, would you like to? Well, I think the case of the business perspective was a very telling showcase for European cooperation. It just, I mean, you mentioned Erasmus as a very specific program, but it just shows the genuine interest on both sides to go on with cooperation. So that will definitely stay whatever the election outcome is, because there is this awareness that within Europe, you need to be interacting with your partners. We have uh, like 18 neighbor nations from Germany and we need to fulfill this role of having this European perspective. 
And it's a very genuine self-interest as well. We, we trade and have business with the European neighbors. And to do so, we need to develop both infrastructure and human resources. And we have now had a very specific case with the recovery plan for Europe with the pandemic, but focusing on just the lines you're mentioning, sustainability being green transition and digital transition as well. So this is a demand which stays. And I think what helped open the eyes a little bit on the German uh, training perspective and academic perspective is that we were lagging behind on some fields. We're doing excellently on others, mechanics, whatever, but we need to have this fusion and to see that we actually develop further and add on that. So there's a keen interest to keep that running. And um, there's a great confidence that the Nordic partners and Finland formers is the main partner for that. So that will remain, I'm quite sure. The European orientation for all the parties is also the same. And there's differences in what to allow European Parliament to do. There may be discussions on fiscal programs. Yes, true. But also, you were rightly mentioning the constitutional a background in Germany. This is a very cautious debate because we have rulings by our constitution calls also on these issues, so much so that the European Commission at times is questioning the European supremacy of law. So we have an issue there. And I think this echoes a little bit with the Finnish apprehensions as well on own resources decision of the European Union and others. So there is a common thread of interest which will remain regardless of the composition. And then, of course, we should not forget that we have now to safeguard the achievements uh, after having experienced lockdowns and border closings, whatever, of what we reach within Europe. So Schengen, a key, and others, the free movement of people, of students, of training. And that's something, I think, which is strongly felt to be a need to upkeep and to bring this on and not to forget about that after the crisis. I think this is something in common with all the parties involved and from the general public as well. So there's a craving to go back to this free circulation physically within Europe. And there's a need to do so. I think on the um, policy details, how to behave towards Russia and other issues, again, Finland has a role to play. And, and we want to listen to that and to this experience because um, it's a very closely knit security system here within Europe. We have had recent lessons also in other scenarios. We, we had just dramatic developments in Kabul. So all this reflects back on partners. And I think if you look then of who has something in common, we phrase it easily as politicians saying we have like-minded partners and that's very much what we want to keep up as a dialogue with Finland. So I think rest assured on that level, um, dialogue will go on and the need to involve neighbors in decision making Whatever the size is in Europe, you cannot walk alone. I mean, you have to have partners on board. And that's where we're very, very close. We have this whole value debate. We have the human rights debate. We have the rule of law debate. And you couldn't find closer partners in Germany and Finland on that. OK, thank you. While I'm asking Thomas to say a brief comment, I'm also asking the audience to prepare yourself for some questions if you would like to have for the panel. OK, but Thomas first, please. Yeah, um, well, first of all, of course, it's it's difficult for us to um, evaluate the legacy of, of Merkel's long period in office. Maybe in 10 or 15 years time would be the right moment to assess whether um, whether she she could actually prepare Germany for what's what's coming or uh, whether some crucial reforms were maybe uh, um, not not uh, made in time. Um, um, all in all, like right at this point, uh, one, one thing that at least uh, to my mind uh, sort of dominates when I, when I think about Merkel's legacy is just uh, ambivalency. Yeah. So uh, the, the, there were all these crises that uh, Annalina mentioned and Merkel was very instrumental in, in solving them. At the same time, many of the solutions were very haphazard, superficial. Uh, they, they, they may ha not have been permanent solutions. Of course, it would have been too much to expect from, from one person and one country to solve all the, all the uh, issues, but still, uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing that, that I, I think is very interesting about Merkel is that uh, she's not really associated with the uh, particular political agenda. It's more her style of policy making that has characterized her period in office. It's 
pragmatic, it's reactive, it's geared towards consensus both among uh, EU partners but also within Germany. Uh, it's, uh, her style is al always showing careful thought. She assesses all the options. Uh, but at the same time, she's, uh, she's also been very slow in reacting to some, some things. She's more managerial, not necessarily exercising strong, strong leadership. Uh, so again, here some, some ambivalency, I would say. On the one hand, I think Merkel has been such a welcome counterweight to, to the populist zeitgeist that we have had in so many countries. Such a great counterweight to uh, leaders like Putin, uh, Erdogan, Trump. Uh, on the other hand, her time in office has not really been conducive to big political debates within Germany. Uh, she has not or mostly not use her personal popularity, uh, popularity or her coalition building uh, skills to actually drive through some uh, larger change, uh, larger reforms. And, um, but however, all, all that said, um, I think some, some notable decisions have actually been taken during Merkel's period in office, uh, giving up nuclear energy in the aftermath of the Fukushima disaster. That was a very surprising move. Uh, agreeing to the rescue of packages to the financially and economically hit EU member states. Again, that was not self-evident from, from the beginning. Taking in a significant number of asylum seekers during the refugee crisis. Uh, again, rather a uh, surprising move for, for many. And now, um, just recently, laying the seed to, the, to this EU's recovery, recovery package together with, uh, with the French President Emmanuel Macron. So, um, I mean, even, even, even though Merkel's period in office is often associated with stability, uh, there's always this surprising element. And even though uh, before I, I mentioned that there are some constraints that actually uh, point towards continuity in, in German politics and in, in German policies in different areas. Of course, the world is shifting very much around us, as both Annalena and, and Mr. Ambassador have pointed out. And, and it, it may not uh, be, uh, or perhaps it's not that important who is the next chancellor. It's much more important what's happening around us that can have a much bigger impact on, on Germany than, than the name of the next chancellor. Okay, thank you. Now, time for the audience. Any questions? There's a microphone. That's okay. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Nina, Nina Huovinen, and I'm from the International Relations in Metropolia. Um, first of all, again, thank you to, to Mr. Ambassador, your, your Excellency, for visiting our campus, and thank you to all the panelists for the interesting discussion. And I also wanted to thank Nora for organizing this. Um, referring to what Annalena said about the importance of this election to, to all of Europe, um, we had a small group of colleagues talking about obsessing about the US elections, presidential elections. And um, then someone said, why are we obsessing about this when in fact we should be more interested in, in German politics and what happens there? And here we are. So that's how, how this uh, was organized. Um, but I have a question as well. It's um, maybe not specifically related to, to the German elections, but to, to European politics in, in general, and uh, specifically to, to the freedom of movement in, in Europe. Um, working in the international office, and me and my colleagues, here we mostly work with uh, international mobility, so sending and receiving students uh, abroad, and, and also staff, and uh, most of them to Europe and from Europe, and um, we do, have this wonderful thing called freedom of movement in, in Europe. But um, in recent years, I, I feel that it's been, in a, in a way, sort of um, compromised, if, if that's the right word, with, uh, with Brexit and the refugee crisis and the rise of sort of nationalist, um, populist parties and sentiments in, in different European countries. And I'm wondering, how do you see it? Is it still something that we can take for granted in, in Europe? that we have this freedom of movement. Um, I still remember a time when it wasn't there. Um, Vera Gaia is of a generation that doesn't remember such a time ever existing. But yeah, how do you see this? 
free movement within within Europe or European Union? Please. Yes. I'm afraid we cannot take it for granted. And the pandemic just has shown the case. Uh, Schengen regulations have a few escape clauses for good reasons, public health and others. Sometimes by member states they were extended or surprisingly re-implemented, whatever. So no, I th think it pointed out to a high grade of fragility. And I think the biggest challenge is to keep in mind that the acquis, what we have achieved so far, is not to be taken for granted. We have actually to, to fight for this and to work for it and to press it through. There's other pressures on the system, like how to react to migration movements. Uh, close borders, open them up, control it more. So from different angles, pandemic, health, or migration, or political general xenophobia, which is not alien to German domestic debate either, um, these are constant challenges to the system. And we have saw that, you mentioned the case of the Brexit, we saw that member states of the Union were desperate to renegotiate treaties, bilateral treaties, how to allow for students to go on studying and how to invite even British students back to continental Europe, so to speak, to, to continue studies. So this networking, this interlinking we experience, it's a fragile institution and we have to fight for it and we have to depend on people to know about the advantages to actually come forward and say, no, we want to insist on this point and this is the core of our interest. No. Annalena, please. I totally agree what Ambassador just said, but there's parallel development at the same time when uh, the labor market, for instance, in Germany is booming and because of the democra demography, there's a, there's a need for 400,000 foreign workers yearly in Germany. And so at, at the same, in, so there's a huge competition of workers going on inside the European Union right now, also in Finland. So to a student in Metropolia, I would like to say that well to understand Germany is to understand the uh, finance and business logic of Europe and, and, and the global markets as well. So it's, it's I really say, would like to recommend you to follow the, the development in the post-Merkel era in Europe. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the conversation. It's been interesting. And as we know, Germany is probably the most important single country in the European Union. And my, uh, I'm Lauri Narine from Metropolia, senior lecturer. Been here uh, for 13 years, and I've seen the technological change and also lots of other changes. And uh, we are living interesting times, uh, to put it at least in a polite way, and also dangerous times. Uh, lately. Uh, my question is about the European Union and uh, what you, Mr. Ambassador, think about the late changes. Uh, naturally, you know that Finns were not at ease with the thing that the European Union started to take common loans, meaning actually that uh, those countries who have uh, taken care at least to some prudent level on their own economics are actually giving money to the countries who haven't cared so much about that. Do you think, as it was sold to the Finnish public, that this was a one-timer, or as quite a few people say that, hey, it's the beginning of a new time, and uh, we are having a European Union, which is not the one we voted for in 1994. Do you see it one-timer or a change of uh, paradigm? Thank you. I would focus on the one-timer for one specific reason, because we, that's the most recent case that we're talking about, Next Generation Euro Budget and the multi-annual framework, and the own resources decision for the European Union. One-timer, why? Uh, it's true it was a French-German initiative in the end to bring about the package, but it was also on the foundations of the Finnish negotiating box for the multi-annual framework and the Finnish presidency uh, of the European Union. A one-timer because I think other than in Finland, there was no connection to the domestic debate back in Germany to the financial crisis, where all the elements you were mentioning, no bailout and others, were of great relevance. 
Um, in this case, we just had seen that northern Italy, eastern Belgium, eastern France were heavily afflicted by the pandemic. The most wealthiest regions in the whole of Europe with a standard of living well above the German average. And so people said, well, this is actually a natural catastrophe. It's nothing to do with failed state or bad government. It's a national catastrophe. And that bridged somehow the approach. We know that for different reasons, the French friends were pressing for different approaches. But in this specific case, I would say we hijacked some of their motivation and put in this nutshell of saying, well, this is a sui generis case. And um, luckily so, our constitutional course, uh, court went along with this uh, feeling and judgment. And interesting enough, those people actually put forward planes uh, in these constitutional courts in Germany uh, do you refrain so from doing that in the specific case of the recovery plan for um, Europe now after this pandemic hit? It is true that uh, people may think, aha, if it worked once, why not have it a second go? Now, in our understanding, this was a one-off. And um, it is true that within this package of the European own resources, there is a debate going on of sources of revenue for the European Union. So not loans particularly, but other form of taxes. And there were elements already in the multilateral framework for financial issues to see what kind of direct taxation income could be provided to European institutions, to European Union as such. So this debate may go on a certain level. But um, I assure you that we had mentioned that the Social Democratic Minister of Finance was also very reluctant to move along on these lines because there is an echo to the very Finnish debate also in the German group. I know that there has been talk of the frugal members of the Union or the Hanseatic League of the European Union member states being more the conservative fiscal approach. And uh, I felt at times also as an ambassador that we were reproached as Germans having left part this or that group. Um, I would say <laughs> with the present um, needs and pressures which were mentioned, the huge spending we were having on national budgets, this logic of balancing your own budget will be very strong in the European debate in future. And I think uh, the exceptional effort we were making now um, leads to very specific domestic homework, how to rebalance our budgets. We have a large new deficit now with all the measures we did following the pandemic. And I would expect every German party in charge to recalculate very closely and see how to mend that first. So in that sense, it's a one-off. And um, whatever other members of the union may bring forward would have to be decided unisono in the, in the setting of Brussels. So there is no risk of being pulled off the table on that issue, I believe, in the near future. OK, Anna, then would you like to? Well, I would say that it's more game changer. We have used it now twice, so why not third time? Uh, but uh, it's not only Germany that uh, set the rules. We are facing uh, Fr France election next year. So the, the big thing is that how the next uh, French president and next German chancellor find themselves and uh, what's their uh, common European project and of course it's there's uh, Finland is one equal member of the European Union so there's a time to rethink a solidarity and uh, be the, our fiscal politics and where to be with whom so it's not so that we are just uh, following Germany whatever Germany is doing uh, that that used to be the Finnish European politics, like a, uh, a main tone, uh, but but we shouldn't be surprised if there's big changes coming. Thank you. Anyone, one final word, something you want desperately want to say still? Any one of the panelists. Word is free, Mr. N Ambassador, I please. think it would be worth to reassure the, the audience that um, no big revolution is immediately pending. So whatever the outcome of this election, and after the 26th of September, everybody will have predicted it correctly, um, there will be a phase of coalition forming. And that is uh, potentially a lengthy period. So the present government would still be as a caretaker government in charge of events. Um, I don't know where we reach the Dutch or the Belgian levels here, but uh, sometimes this stretches for weeks or even months on end, or sometimes you need a second go. Uh, that all sort of has been the recent German experience. So in that sense, there will be ample time to see how things will develop. And also, of course, 
um, these coalitions are negotiated by parties, and on the German side, they do this tremendously thoroughly. So having 1,000 pages of programs for the election, there will be lots of pages for coalition papers and concepts to come also. And um, having this as a compromise process, you wouldn't expect radical changes. It will be very much depending on who is actually in the coalition talks. There will be accents, there will be compromises, and there will be new perspectives. But all will have to respect the, the laws of gravity, being finances, being resources, and being outside uh, framework conditions. So this will be a longer process, not overnight. That will take quite a while. OK, thank you. Kai, what you still like to If I may still say also, um, now after listening to all this discussion, and uh, I really hope that we, as um, uh, being having the role in higher education, and uh, that we really want to defend Europe together, <laughs> uh, whether it's in form of EU, what's EU going to be in the future, but uh, Finland and Germany both can uh, make a big uh, uh, difference and, and uh, impact. And we here in Metropolia can educate uh, our own students and our exchange students and, and do all kind of efforts to, to keep up the, the good cooperation that we have at the moment and even find new forms to develop. Thank you. I think we can finish with those beautiful words about European collaboration and, and working together towards European collaboration. And also, I would like to point out, I think we have perhaps the Finnish version of the coalition um, uh, <laughs> results of the German elections, we can see here in the polls. Thank you very much. And I would now like to ask Rita Konkola, CDO of the um, Metropolitan University of Applied Sciences. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador and other panelists, it was very, very interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, I learned a lot of uh, the uh, political situation in Germany and especially this coming election. And I'm sure that we all will follow it now more actively and, and waiting if this result is coming to be the real result or not. So thank you for raising our minds towards that uh, election. And broadly about the situation in Germany and especially in the future in the European level. It is very important to have our students here. Thank you, Vera, and our teachers, and uh, other panelists sharing your uh, concrete uh, examples about uh, student exchange and teaching and also this broader broader uh, aspect of, of the situation in Europe and what we all want it to be very, very good cooperation. I'm so happy that in Metropole we have very good cooperation between German universities of applied sciences and Metropole and, and it has all be, always been very, very good uh, way to learn when you go outside. In my uh, study time, it was not so easy. And now I hope that it will be easy in the future also. Uh, it's always nice to visit in German. I have been there a lot of times in, with my husband, uh, with our car, visiting uh, almost all parts of Germany during these last 20 years. And I really hope we can make it real again next summer. So it will be over this pandemic time. Always very friendly and nice, nice place to visit. Thank you. <laughs>